I'm Sean McKinney. I'm a sinus guy, and I have with me my uh, boss and uh, toughest critic, Marianne Norman, who's also from Sinus. Marianne, take it. And she'll be leading the uh, tutorial. So many of you have more experience on this topic than I do. I'm just going to give you a disclaimer. I'm a client. Uh, why you would need something like this, this anterior replication network. Things that we see um, with our customers. And then I'll, I'll show you the test configuration just as an overview before we, we dig into it. And, uh, and then we got time for breaks in there. There's going to be coffee at 1030. So we'll certainly break for that. We have to um, set up our environments. So we have a VM that um, we tested in VirtualBox and VMware. So I don't know, um, you know, we're, we're assuming that, that you have one of those hypervisors installed on your desktop. If you don't, we have a limited number of VMs that we can lend you that are in the cloud on Linux. We have, so we'll, during our break, just come talk to me and we'll get you set up and lend you a VM. And then we're just going to run through it. Okay, so that's kind of what we're planning on doing this morning. Hope that's um, what you expected. I mean, we know what LDAP is, I'm assuming, but this is just kind of an opening slide. LDAP is, of course, a database and a network protocol uh, governed by the Internet Engineering Task Force, specifically 4511. The common use case is something related to system management, system and user management. Uh, you know, signing on to Linux machines, what are your privileges, maintaining servers, that kind of thing. So the idea here is the directory is a common place to store the information needed to manage those servers, as opposed to having them distributed out to the machines individually. You know, the old way is we kept everything on files in the machine, so if you needed to add somebody to the machine, you had to go and touch that machine and add them to the file, and then when they weren't working anymore, you had to make sure you removed them, and that was all very tedious and hard to uh, maintain. And so the idea with LDAP and the use case that we're seeing again and again is you centralize that inside the directory. And so the, obviously the credentials of the user will be in there, but also their group information, uh, net groups, and things like that for, for managing that access to those servers. And with the cloud, this is just becoming more and more important because machines are, are so numerous. I have no idea why I did that, but... Um, so with LDAP, we're talking about schema. Schema is the shape of the data. And uh, so in order for things to work, then you have to have a common schema because the client has to know the shape of the data that the server is serving up. So uh, with um, system management, again, we have this RFC, some sort of RFC 2307 type of a schema for the shape of the data. And there's, there's some various shapes of that uh, nuances. But essentially what you end up with is a common schema for the user. So here we're, gonna, we're talking about POSIX account and a common schema for the groups and a common schema for the network machines and that kind of thing. Sudo is also another thing that uh, you know, we like to centralize. Uh, obviously Linux machines have files, sudo or files that you can put the privileges of, of users in there, and that is also very hard to maintain and tedious. So, uh, you know, best practice would be to store the sudo information inside the directory, and so there's a common schema for that, that so that you can do things like control what users can do when they're on the, on the machine. So we're gonna, you know, we're talking about something like that, the sudo LDAP schema for storing that information. And then we can do things like this. You know, we can have these guys, like these ducks here, Huey, Dewey, and Louie, and we want to keep our ducks in a row. And so we can say, yeah, you know, this guy can only log on to these machines, and another guy can only log on to another set of machines, and so on and so forth. And 
manage that. I'm just certain you guys all know this, and this is just, I'm stating the obvious, but we gotta start somewhere. Ultimately, this is the kind of architecture we're talking about. This is what we see with our customers, things like this, where you have an interior tier replication network. Starting at the top, you'll have a couple masters. Uh, we like to, to do mirror mode because it's a pretty uh, concise, and reliable way of, of doing replication. And then you'll replicate downward into different tiers. And so this tier here is what we call the cascading replica tier. And so, you know, the idea here is that we're talking about a, a very large organization with data centers in different regions. Perhaps you have a data center here in, in, in Europe, and one in, in Asia, and one in the U.S., and one. So this is really kind of the big picture of what we're talking about here, of what we're trying to do. And so, yeah, these are read-write, and they're in um, mirror mode, so they're in lockstep with each other and you'll have some kind of device up front to route the right traffic to one or the other. And that's the most reliable way to do it with, with OpenLDAP replication is to route your right traffic to one or the other. And you don't always get to do that, but that's the, what, you know, the most reliable way. And that way you won't have split brain problems where you're trying to update the same entry on two different machines and get into some sort of uh, inconsistent situation. So you'll have perhaps a virtual IP up front that's routing to one master or the other for right traffic and then that replicates downward. Another key feature of this network would be what we're calling um, filtered replication. So the replicas can pull entries from the master according to some sort of criteria. And so what you'll do is set up a, a search filter in the replication uh, configuration of what data would get pulled downward. And you can make those filters more and more specific as you go down. And so the goal would be, again, you know, you have these regions and then these locations. And so maybe a region would be, say, EU. And maybe another region is, is North America and another region is Asia. Well, with EU now, you have regulatory compliance, things like GDPR, that says, hey, I can't have my consumers down into a North American server. So you can, you know, you can do that kind of thing with filtered replication. And then at the top here, we have really the applications that are managing the data in the masters. What we see again and again is with our customers is, hey, our data is in Active Directory. Active Directory is, shall we say, not real performant when it comes to some wide area network where you have thousands of machines. You don't want to tie those to Active Directory. It would, the latency would be too great. The server performance isn't consistent enough that you would have the kind, kind of latency that you would expect with users to sign on. So what we see again and again is that we have some sort of replication from Active Directory that will pull it down into OpenLM. According to, and there's various ways in which to do that. It's beyond the scope of this, although we can start talking about them. And then, um, then this becomes the network that serves these machines. And so these machines could be there's something in the in the edge, could be in the cloud, uh, you know, something like that. But it's something other than the traditional corporate network of say of something managed by Active Directory. And then also at the top, you know, we have this blue module called the Business Logic Module. And so that's a lightweight IDM process. So the idea there is that you have a way in which to pull specific entries from that Active Directory system according to a criteria necessary to push it into OpenLDAP. So perhaps the network is a subsidiary of a giant corporation. And so all of the user entries are in the Active Directory, but they only want to pull the subsidiary's entries down into, into the OpenLDAP. Um, and so you'll have this business logic module in place that knows how to do that. 
and can manage the, um, the data mapping rules. So maybe you have to handle things like user ID collisions and how do you generate user IDs or how do you, how do you generate home directories or whatever specific elements that are in that OpenLDAP network can be handled by the business logic module. And then it should allow simplified customizations. So we're talking about lightweight IDM, specific purpose for this. So this is the kind of thing that we work on quite a lot. So obviously we're not going to be able to do that today, right? So um, there's going to be, um, number one, we don't have enough VMs to do something like that. Um, so we're, we want to kind of distill the salient features from that into an example so that you'll kind of get the idea of what's going on here. And so we've taken uh, a subset of those open LDAP instances and distilled it into this example. And so what we've really got is a pair of masters in mirror mode and a couple replicas that are pulling by a filter, like, like I discussed. And so you can see that we're not really like here, you know, we've got, so say this, this cascading replica here is pulling for zone A and this one's pulling for zone B. Well, there's not redundancy there, so, but that's beyond the scope of this example. So we just wanted to kind of show you how to, how to start building something like this. And so what we've got in this example is, the, is three instances of OpenLDAP running on a single machine, two masters and two cascading replicas. Any questions so far? So this would be the architecture of the sample. So we have, uh, again, two providers running in mirror mode and two replicas that are read-only. Each listens on a different port. So master provider A is on 389, provider B is on 390, Consumer C is on 391, and D is on 392. And so the masters are in mirror mode, and the replicas are doing delta sync REPL with the masters, all running on a single instance. Four instances of open LDAP. Yeah. Sorry? Oh, thank you. Yeah, four instances. And so, you would never do this in the real world, right? You would never run four instances of, of an LDAP server on a single machine. That would be dumb, right? I mean, obviously, for high availability, they've got to be on different machines. So this is a toy, just so you can have everything running on one machine. You can look at the configuration. Hello, Peter. Welcome. Hi, Tom. Okay, so just summarizing, two masters, mirror mode, delta sync REPL, two read-only replicas, delta sync REPL with the masters, selectively replicating based on a filter. We have to um, enable access log and sync prob overlays on the master in order to do the, the delta sync REPL protocol, and all of these are running on a single machine. Uh, so I'm not a server-side replication expert, but just, you know, mirror mode is, can be termed as active-active, hot standby. And I already talked about how, you know, you're routing right traffic to one or the other to sort of avoid the split, split brain. So in our configuration that we'll be looking at in just a moment, we have four configuration files one that corresponds with each, each instance. You got a slap B A, which is for the, the one master, slap B B for the second master, C for one replica, D for the other replica. So a little bit more on the master configuration. So this will be in the project that you'll be looking at. We've enabled security for these um, instances, TLS, uh, they're all running, again, all the instances are running on a single machine, so we only had to generate a single server certificate and a single private key in order to have all these instances talking with TLS. 
we've generated the certificates for you, they are in the project. The configuration will point to the location there in the setup. So we're saying the TLS 3.3 in production, you would want to require TLS. Here we're relaxing that to make it easy to test. There's some identity mapping going on. The replicas are connecting to the masters using a certificate off based authentication. So the, uh, the master has to be able to pull the identity out of the certificate and map it to a service account that has access to the data so that the replica, the replica can read the data. So there's some configuration in the master that you'll see that's pulling that, that user out, you know, mapping it to a user that's in the directory, the CN equals replicator. And that user in the access control list then has the, the read access in order to do the replication that it needs. There's a number of master modules that have to be, um, I should say, a number of OpenLDAP uh, modules that have to be enabled inside of the master for this to work. We can get into that in a bit. And then there's uh, a few overlays. OpenLDAP has overlays as a way of extending the things that the machine, machine can do. And DB overlays are what turns OpenLDAP into this multi-purpose thing that can do quite a lot. So you enable one overlay or another based on the specific use case that you have. So in this case, the masters are providers. So we've uh, enabled the sync prov overlay. And they're also supporting Delta Sync REPL, which is a change-based REPL. Uh, replication protocol, so we've enabled the um, access log, which is the change log, on the masters. Uh, we also have just a few more we've thrown in there just for miscellaneous referential integrity, server-side sorting, and password policies. Two databases in the master. One is the main database that's for the data to hold the data. Both databases are using LNDB. And uh, so each master has its own database, obviously. And then we're mapping those databases to a specific folder on the machine in order to hold those files. Similar with the access log, which is the change log on the masters, we had to map each master to a different folder on the machine for each specific access log, which contains the changes. Hence the Delta sync REPL. Okay, so the replicas are much simpler. Same scenario with the security TLS. Uh, exactly the same. Fewer modules are um, enabled on the replica. And this is what I was talking about earlier in the replication configuration. We've got a filter there. So the sample data that's part of this example has, um, we've created a, uh, a custom user called sample person, which is based on, I believe, INET or person in POSIX account. And then that had an attribute, a, a multi-valued attribute called sample zone. And so that sample zone is how we are controlling which uh, region a user entry will replicate downward. And in this case, this would be the zone, uh, the replica C, because it's, it's going to be pulling the, the zone one data. And it's also refresh and persist, which is delta sync REPL. Any questions so far? Have I got anything wrong from the experts in the room? Nothing worth pointing out. I'm sure I've got something wrong. I'm just certain. OK, so what's missing? Okay. Um, we're not really doing password policies right. I'll get to that in just a second. And um, we're doing this sort of old way of configuration with the site deconf. And really, the recommended approach is to use CN equals config. So this example could very well be using the dynamic config, but we just wanted to keep it simple. So talk a little bit about password policies. Password policies is a very important requirement. Personally, never gone into production with OpenLDAP where a customer didn't enable password policies. 
Um, so the idea here is, again, we're back to these <laughs> machines, possibly in the cloud, it doesn't really matter, and you have users logging on to them, so perhaps over SSH, again, it doesn't really matter. And you have, anytime you have users binding with, a, with OpenLDAP or any LDAP directory, you're going to have password policy events, so things like password failures, right, is an example. Uh, password lockout, you had too many failures and, and now they're locked out, you know, a very common, necessary thing. Uh, passwords expired, there's another one, okay, so how do you handle that? So, you know, we mentioned that these replicas are read-only, so how does a bind that's going from a machine to a replica that's read-only store that information? So it, it, it could be done, and, and it's commonly done. It's just not covered by this example, but I just wanted to touch on it. And really what we would do is we would turn on referrals in the replicas, and then password events occurring in the replicas would be referred upwards, and then the replica would have what's called a chaining overlay, which handles that referral on, on behalf of the client. Question? Go ahead. So Chris. password event, is that like someone entered their password incorrectly? Or even correctly, yeah, any kind of password, any bind, you know, there's going to be, but yes, so the question is, with a password event, would that be like a, the password was entered incorrectly? And yeah, that's an example of a password event. And so, in that situation, when you enable password policies, the OpenLDAP um, password policy overlay tracks that. And so, it, there's a counter, and every time they, they fail, there would be a, a timestamp that's um, an operational attribute that gets added to that entry. That's part of the password policy schema. And so um, after so many of those and it's configurable, then the, the password policy overlay perhaps might lock the, uh, the entry out from preventing authentication. In that case, another attribute would be added, which would be the PW lockout attribute. And so that's, yeah, so that's what we're talking about. And, and yeah. I what you're doing here um, implements what a lot of corporate security officers would expect you to do and ask for. Personally, if I was asked to do this, I would fight back very hard because this is a self-denial service attack. Um, anything to do with password failure events is going to be some trouble. Oh, sorry, yeah. Um, I'll just repeat that. Um, what you're doing here is exactly what a lot of corporate security officers would ask for. Uh, personally, if I was asked to do it, I would try and fight back because you are opening up your master servers to uh, a very easy denial of service attack. Um, your entire worldwide, I'm about to look at your first example, a million plus people organization is going to generate a lot of password failures per day, even by mistake. That will wipe out your master servers. So I would be very wary about actually implementing this. Correct. Uh, the other side of it is what, how do you, you know, say a, a, a brute force attack, how do you prevent that, you know? So you have these machines on, you know, uh, on a network and and so they're, they're constantly being flooded with um, nefarious agents that are trying various passwords. So how do you prevent that from happening? So it's pro, right? There's never a perfect answer here. Well, you can't prevent that, but that's why you want a certain minimum quality of password uh, so that on average, all passwords will withstand the sort of attack rate that is achievable across the internet. In that scenario, though, you're still hitting the replicas. Yes. You're still floating the replicas. Yes, but only one. Yeah. So it's it's agreed. Uh, password policies are difficult. I would say uh, they certain certainly create difficulties with replication, as we're discussing here. Um, but nevertheless, Andrew, um, with our customers, we almost always see it. So. Oh yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And they never listen to me. So I'll point them to you next time. Um, okay, so uh, password events will be referred upwards uh, via the referrals, and then the chain overlay in the replica is really what handles the smarts of that so that the client really doesn't know anything about it. So it's just binding. It doesn't have to worry about it. So the, 
the instance will do, the chain overlay will handle the sparse. And, uh, and then they'll just get referred upwards and upwards, and then eventually, uh, when it gets to the master, then the, uh, the attributes will get updated as we've discussed, and then it just replicates back downward normally. So that's something that we are not doing here that uh, for a, a network like we're discussing you would need, possibly. Okay, a little bit on the test data that's in there. You know, we've got these ducks, Huey, Louie, and Dewey, and we've got a couple test zones, because we have two replicas, and that one's for zone one, one's for zone two. So one of the ducks could go to both zones, he'll replicate down one of both. One duck will go to zone two, one duck will go to zone one. We've got some groups, we've got a default group, sample, should be sample ducks, and then we've got, um, you know, say administrators, which perhaps would be corresponding with root access, and then auditors, which perhaps would be corresponding with read-only access, and we're giving the ducks membership to one or the other or both. And then we talked about pseudo roles before, mapping these groups to pseudo roles in order to enforce um, that level of access on the machines. That's kind of the use case we're talking about here. And then this would be kind of the big picture where the, you know, the ducks can access various, uh, they'll, they'll replicate to various uh, zones and then they'll have different levels of authority based on the data that's stored in open on that. So is there any questions up to now on this? Okay. So getting to the project itself, uh, we yesterday created a prod. We added this the the project collateral, you know, the configuration files and the certificates and stuff are added to a um, this project in my public GitHub account called OpenLDAP MMR Tutorial. Uh, the the virtual machine uh, the the machine image that we give you will already have this staged on it, but if you want to try this. Uh, on, on your own machines or whatever, then you can just access that and follow the instructions. Um, and so there's several readme's. The number one readme there, that's how we uh, installed uh, CentOS 7 ISO into um, the hypervisor. And you shouldn't have to do that if you use our image. You'll just start with number two where you'll enable the image within your hypervisor. We tested it with VirtualBox and VMware, although I don't have a lot of confidence that it's going to work for everybody. So, we, you know, we very likely might have to help. Uh, we, again, we have a fallback that we can lend you a, an instance of CentOS 7 that's running in Linode if you need it. And then there's two readme's for doing the installation configuration, one for the masters, one for the replicas. And then they each have some test instructions in there to verify that we'll do, we'll, we'll, do, we'll change some entries and make sure everything replicates and do some verification and, and that kind of thing. And there's our contact information. So that's really the file is called readme.master.md, I believe. Readme.master.md. So we're going to run through this together, these instructions. Um, my boss there, Marianne, is going to be doing the demonstration. I'm not the boss of you. Quit being mean to me. And so you don't have to do the prerequisites if you have our virtual machine, because we've done that already for you. Okay, so. It's a CentOS machine. Can you scroll down a little bit? You don't have to install Git. You don't have to clone the repo. The repo is under Home Student. So everything should be there. Um, and we're going to start on step number one under installation. And so this first step is really just a, it's really kind of just explains what's going on here. Um, what we're installing is called Simus's Open LDAP for Linux. So the story here is Red Hat announced this was this year that they're no longer supporting Open LDAP. 
And so Simus, we're taking over that support um, in terms of the Red Hat installations. And so we've basically got a build of their sources there. We're calling it Simus Open LVAP for Linux. And so that's what we're going to be running on these machines. So did you get in? Yeah. Awesome. And so do you have under home student? Because I don't know if we staged the. You might have to do the prerequisites. Is there a student created? Okay, so you need to do the prerequisites. When you go back to the prereqs, yeah, so do young. I think get might be one there. But that re so but this is not the repo that we're going to call so That's it's the wrong repo. This is the repo you want to clone. That's the repo you want to call. that step um, if I mean we're going to copy and paste from uh, from this MD file um, you can go I mean, there's various ways you can pull that up you can pull that locally on your browser by going to the same address find that and just copy and paste it uh, or you could edit the file locally in the project via say BI and, and copy and copy it however you want to do it but we're, we're going to be doing these commands interactively so let's start with the with number one. Um, so we're going to and there is not open LDAP installed on here, but we'll just go ahead and again just as a level set we'll do it. So um, if say you were upgrading a, a Red Hat VM, use Sinus with LDAP device. You would stop as that B, and then you would. Do that young erase, and then there will be nothing there. We do. Oh, we need wget. Okay. Uh, thanks, Andrew. You're going to need to do yum install wget right now. Just use your new machine to say yum install wget. <coughs> that has the Simus open all that for Linux and we're going to stage it onto the VM go ahead did you do it like that and that's why you got to have that you get on there so previous stuff yeah. 
do an update. No, no, no. Failure, and we're going to have to do the race to try it, so just go ahead and copy that command. Um, and I, said, I think I said this earlier, but the best way to do that is to either edit that file locally in VI, and then you can copy it, or you could just navigate to the public repo in your browser, you can copy it that way. You certainly yeah. don't want to have to type that whole command out. So copy it and then paste it in your SSH session. So um, hit it. Yeah, so it worked for you. I'm not sure. I'm yeah. sorry, where did we find that command? Um, so you can either, Chris, you can either get to it. Like you could, you could create. Oh, I think yes. I need to be. Um. Yes. I can't buy the update button. You install. Yeah. Of course. Ah. Every day, but don't do that. But I hate to get it. Yeah, I can remember. Install the passage I just figured that I need to get this Okay. So after that step, you'll have the sinuses open up after the Linux install package on that VM, and everybody, is everybody able to do that? Good. Yes? Who can't install it? Anybody? Good. All right, next step. So, um, Marianne, could you go switch back? So, step four, you're going to do from the home folder on that VM. So, home student, open all that MMR tutorial. So, the, the command, Marianne, could you go back, please? Yeah, so those copy commands are relative to that package that's on under home student. Okay, so, um, now, go ahead. Yeah, just change the home student. There we go. Can you make that a little bigger? Yeah. And then, yeah, just copy those, copy the copy commands. Didn't mind that. You can just do them all at the same time. Right? You can just copy every one of them. Yeah. So what are we doing there? We're copying the schema. So um, open all that for Linux. The, uh, the package for the configuration is under Etsy open all that. So we're copying the, the, the schema that we need for this example there. And then we're copying, we talked about those, those slap dconf files, the A, B, C, D files for each instance. And we're copying each of those files to the location that they need to be to run under Linux. And we're copying the certificates to where they're referenced in the uh, configuration. Anybody have problems with that step? Okay, so next step. So now we're going to, for step five, and you gotta do that as root, is you're going to, uh, you're gonna make the, uh, basically, uh, we're making the, the, the configuration folders for the masters, for the two masters. 
just more goop to these examples to work. And, uh, and then the next one is, so for 5B, what we're doing is we're creating the folders for the various databases that are needed for these two master processes to run. We've got two main databases, which is sample A and sample B, and we have two access log databases, which is A and B, so then that has to be run as root. Big net. Anybody have problems with that step? Okay, so now we're going to we're going to configure the runtime. So the, in order for the certificates to work, you have to have, uh, you know, the, the certificate was the server cer certificate has a common name that's going to be the host name of this machine. And that's the only way the certificate validation will work. So we're going to get, on 6A, you're going to get the IP address of whatever your VM is by typing ifconfig. And then you're going to grab that address, which is right there for us, 192.168.56.106. What? And we're going to create a host entry inside the Etsy host file. Right. Can you go back to the instructions? So you can see on the next step, so we get the IP address and then we edit the Etsy host file. And then you're going to add an entry that looks something like this on C. But the host name has to be slapped each way for the certificate to validate. And that IP obviously will be whatever your IP address is if you got from an IP config. And we'll edit your IP, your, your, your host file, and put that in there. And then ping it afterwards. Ping that host name to make sure that resolves. Installation was successful as well. That the open LDAP package is correctly installed through the machine. Okay, so everybody still tracking? Do we need to wait for anybody? Okay, so next step is we are going to add the test data to the master A, by that 9A step, you do a site the add, <coughs> and load that test data, so copy that command and paste it into your, you already verified, oh, that's correct, okay, yeah, you can do this, that's true, the first step verifies Everything's good, and then the second step will. So, yeah, 9A verifies, and then the 9B actually does the import of the data. And now, if that works, your database is correctly configured, your instance is correctly configured, and you have data loaded up into the first database. So that's, so that's, we talked about that test data. 
you see we got ducks and we got groups and post groups and pseudoers and things like that in there. Okay, so uh, next step. Now we're going to configure the syslogger. We're going to go ahead and get it for all four instances right now. So um, you know, edit the syslog with 10a. You got to run that as root. So uh, vi etsy r syslog config. go down to where the local four is. <coughs> local seven, I should say. And then just paste those in there. And so just hold on right there, Marianne. So really what we're doing, as you can see, is each instance will map to a different log file in terms of the messages. This is not something you probably do in production, but it's fine for testing. So that when we're troubleshooting, you can see what's going on. So there's two local sevens, is that? Yeah, uh, so the question is, there's two local sevens, is that a problem? I mean, it seems to be okay. I, again, I wouldn't do that production, but yeah, it's gonna interleave the boot messages in there, which won't be very many. But uh, we certainly don't wanna have four instances going to a single file, because then you wouldn't be able to uh, follow what's going on. Okay, so after you, so save the file, the syslog, and then the next step is you're going to restart the syslog daemon for the changes to take effect. Set. All right. Okay. So now we're, you know, this is kind of where, uh, you know, hold my beer, you know, step 11, you know, we'll see what happens. I hope this goes all right. Um, what could go wrong? Fire it up. Um, you know, and, and uh, so do like a ts dash ef grab a slap e and see if it's running. And it is, so you just fired up the one. Master Rage went on 389. Master B will be running on 390. You can kind of see at command line how we're pathing in the, the various config files and the config directories and routing it to a particular logger. This is fine for testing. You wouldn't do it that way in production. So we should, after that step, you should have two instances of slap B running. One on 389, one on 390. And they are in their mode. And presumably, the 390 is now synchronizing with 389, right? Because we just loaded 389, but they're are multi, you know, they're so mode, so it should be getting the updates of the other ones. So, is everybody cool so far? We have two instances of slap D running. Anybody having problems at this point? Speak up. Here. We don't need to rush through it if there's any problems. We're good? Okay. Okay, so this step 12 would be if you want to connect remotely. Um, and, you know, maybe at the end we'll do that. We'll fire up something like Apache Directory Studio. And, or if you wanted to say search from your machine to that one, and you, you know, you have to open up the firewall. So I'll just go ahead and do those, I guess. To open up 389 and 390. That may or may not be something you do in your, in your environments. If you do those, <coughs> you get Okay, so there you go. Open them up to some extent so you won't get your reputation ready. If you had, certainly, yeah, yeah. certainly if you run on this. Yeah, 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 yeah. so, 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 absolutely. Okay, so now we're going to do some testing. Okay. So, um, I think we'll get back to the Apache Directory Studio if we have time at the end. Uh, but we'll just do some command line searches. So let's. So the first one under B, LDAP search, is doing what it's doing is it's connecting to 389. And uh, can you scroll over and see? I don't remember what this one was searching for. We'll just paste it. Yeah. Well, you can just paste it. Yeah. The first. 
Okay, so this one is going to pull everything, right? So it's just connecting to 389 and it's saying, give me everything under the suffix. We'll do the search, and there should be quite a few entries in there, 25, 30, right, all that data. So obviously it's going to be on the 389 machine because that was the one we initially loaded. So the, the next search on the instructions, we'll see if it replicated correctly. So we'll do the same search on against 390 and see if that you know the data should match. And in this case, it did. So we're replicating between the two masters. At least we from 389 to 390. Two instances for everybody, but a couple. We have two instances, two instances of slap B masters, and they are in multi master, or they're actually in mirror mode, and they're they're synchronizing together. And so now we want to kind of test uh, targeted replication to where we can kind of touch an entry on one and see if it goes to the other <coughs> one and that kind of thing. So on uh, 14A. So this is the next command we're doing where we're basically going to do an update on the second master, master B, and we're going to update, um, I believe in this case we're adding Louie, um, one of the ducks, to the 399, 390, we'll go ahead and run that command, and so we've added this duck to 390. So cat that file out. Let's look at the. Let's look at that. Do we got? You should be able to just cat it. Yeah. Yeah. So what are we doing there? We're just we're updating the description. Okay, we're saying, we're calling him what he is, he's a duck, so we're saying, who's a duck? Okay, so now that, so the next step, go to, we're gonna search the, the 389 and see if that actually, <coughs> would be, you know, if they're replicating that way, because it's, they're in mirror mode. Do you think that, that's a change, set search, yeah. Yeah. And we would expect to see, <laughs> uh, uh, so in this case, this search, we're doing this dash E switch, which is, that's listening to that particular machine. It's listening to the sync REPL information. And it does not look like your duck got updated on 389. Or did it? Sorry? You're reading hui entry and not, not hui. Hmm. Oh, you're reading hui. Uh, so change it. So is that the way it is in the instructions? So the instructions are within that. Thank you. Good catch. So the search should actually be UID equals Louie, not UID equals Huey. So we're looking at the wrong duck. Uh, our ducks are not in a row. So change that to Louie. Uh, L O U I E. You guys know who the ducks are? Okay, let's see what happens now. All right, so he doesn't. He doesn't know who the duck. Okay, so, but this this command with the dash e that's kind of helpful, to because if you do an update, then you can like leave that running because it's it's basically um, staying connected, and then you can update the other one, and then you should be able to see in real time that update occur. So that's kind of a troubleshooting technique if you're trying to to look between the that's two. That's like a search and persist, is that what that is? Mm -hmm. Search and persist, yeah, that's uh, where our LDAP experts at. Yeah, it's refresh and persist. We're refreshing and persist. Yeah. Which is what does the um, exclamation signify in that? Critical, critical oh. requirement. So the server doesn't support it, it fails rather than carries on. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Andrew. 
Okay, so are your ducks replicating? You all replicating? We got happy ducks. Okay. So um, next step. Okay, so this is we're getting a little bit deeper into the troubleshooting. Um, this is where I'm really going to have to rely on our experts, but um, the way uh, the replication protocol works for Delta Sync Rebel is it uses what's called a, a, con what, a CSN, which is a uh, context something number of context. Um, doesn't matter. And it's it's a very specific format that's you know discussed here. You basically have a timestamp in there. So there's uh, CSNs that will be at the suffix that correspond with the, all of the replicating um, machine, the machines that are in the replication network, and then each entry will have a CSN number. And that's how the, um, the replication protocol knows um, if, if something has changed. And there's actually a timestamp that's, that's burned into that number, and it's a um, generalized time stream based on RFC 2252. So what we can do is we can look at those CSN values by doing search or you can browse it or whatever. So on this I, that's what Marianne's getting ready to do. And she's gonna look at the CSN on 389. And we have two CSNs, one for each master. As far as reading that, that on the other one on 390 as well. You can see here they're identical. And that's um, when you're really getting into replication uh, troubleshooting, you'll start looking at those CSN values searching them, and we're going to run a, a script, a Python script that evaluates those. <coughs> Not really great for humans to do. Uh, any questions about that part of it? Um, Peter? I just have one context CSN. So you probably don't have... You get one per server that has processed any updates. So if you send all your updates to server A, then you'd only have a CSN from server A. Yeah, okay. If you've done any updates on B and if you've gone back the other way, you'd have one from there as well. Okay. So do that second um, uh, update where you, is it we do an update where we hit 390? Yeah. One hit 389, one hit 390. And then we should get the second one. Thanks, Andrew. Next step. So Marianne already did that double I or she looked at 390 compared to two. Okay, troubleshooting, obviously you can tell the logs. We've already had to do that on a couple of them. Um, each log, there's A and B corresponding with 389 and 390. Set the, um, the logging level in the Slappy Conf. Right now I think we have sync and stats, which is a common level for uh, running in production. But um, sometimes you'll want to run it in debug mode, or there's there's uh, various levels. Okay. But that's going to always be the first thing you do is view the logs. And then this last thing, we're going to run that Python script that I was talking about. It's in the project, which is uh, 15b. Yum install Python LDAP. Yum install Python hyphen LDAP will need to be run before you can run that script. When you type the yeah, just like that.
So it's kind of handy if you look at the look at both directories. Um, you can see in the command it actually you point to both masters or 389 and there's 390. You give it the connection info and then it's gonna we'll compare the two, look at the CSNs to tell you if you're synced. No, I did not write this script. It's, um, I uh, don't, I always steal everything. But um, I, it's, it's a, uh, uh, trying to think what, what it is, if it's a GTL or an LTTL, but it's in the, it's in the project. The author has attribution. I have uh, some questions about uh, master uh, configurations. Okay. Um, I see that uh, you declare uh, Masters uh, as a synchronic uh, clients in the configuration, <coughs> and you are not using um, uh, the server ID form uh, with an adapter array. So I think you are doing um, a mirror mode, uh, a standard mirror mode configuration, but I don't understand why you need to declare on server uh, on master A. A, why you declare uh, a simple uh, for A and B? I understand the question. Yeah, so um, the question is um, why in the master config for A and B does each master config declare both machines in, this, in the replication section? That's the question. So I pull up one of the config files to see what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Just go to the project. So you can see here in the config that, and it's hard to read that, but there's actually two sync REPL declaration stanzas, I guess, for, you know, where, you know, like we're looking at the, the config for the 389, the, the master A, and it actually has a sync REPL section defining 389, and then there's another one for 390, and it's like, why are there two? There should just be master A point to master B and master B point to master A. That's the question. And um, so as you might expect, I'm not going to be able to provide the right answer for you, but I'm going to get it to you. Um, so kind of what I was told is it's just the way it is, but because um, I had the same question but it got into some specifics that I didn't follow. So I'll get back to you on that, come on. So I will. All right, so is everybody back? It looks like everybody's back. So, any other questions that I can't answer? <laughs> uh, when you make a secret replication uh, without using the access log, when you do a synchronous replication when using the access log, uh, you have the um, case when using member of, uh, when you can't assume that the modification of a group uh, will come in the same order uh, with the creation of your user uh, on the full refresh uh, operation of the synchro. Uh, and so you will have inconsistencies uh, in the replication. That the access log synchronization uh, uh, prevent that. So we're talking about um, replicating the member attribute yep. of a group in Delta sync REPL mode. No, he's he's talking about maintaining. I think the question was uh, 
about ma consistently maintaining the member of attribute, which is actually mm -hmm. a backlink from the member entry to the yeah. group entry. And uh, there's an ITS for that, so which which sa basically says that, that you that the member of overlay is not really um, compatible with uh, sync You know, so with Delta sync because sync because the problem is that that um, that the group entry could be replicated after the member mm -hmm. entry during the refresh phase. You know, so that, and uh, you will see that in log messages, for example. Yes. Okay. Thanks, then, Michael. So, and, and as you can see, we're not using the member of overlay in this example. Yeah. So, yeah. so and there's, as Michael said, there's an ITS on that, so that's unknown. Let's discuss that with Andre and uh, Howard. Yeah. So we're gonna we're gonna corner Howard, and we're gonna bombard him with some questions later. All right, so any other questions that I can't answer? Come on. Okay. In your presentation, you talked about the password policy of Ali and how you can uh, uh, synchronize the uh, failed uh, attempts to the masters with a uh, chain of early, but uh, there is no chain of early in the same configuration. But did you plan to? Do it inside the workshop, or it was just uh, on it. Yeah. So the uh, you're right. So I, I I specifically called that out in the presentation and said that um, we're not doing the password policy chaining and referrals. That in in the real world you would need to do that, and we've sidestepped it for this example because a it's kind of complicated to set up, and I ran out of time. But um, so I do plan on adding that to this sample. So um, and this sample will remain public in some form. So we'll let you know just next time we'll do that. Anything else? Maybe just uh, about the question, why are there both our IDs, both Simpreplus, uh, in a single configuration file? Uh, I think if I remember it correctly, if you chose a dynamic configuration instead of a static one, then you have to do it like this. Because uh, when the dynamic configuration is replicated, and so it has to work on all, all the servers, and that's why every RID has to be defined in there. So now the step to go to CN, Config is easy. You're right, gentlemen. Right, Thanks for that. That is what the so the the reason. Come on, back to your first question. Why is there two replication sections in the slappy conf? Um, in dynamic config, you have to do it that way. Um, Just to be, to, to, just to make it more clear, you know, if you want to replicate CN config, which I personally would not rec recommend, yeah, uh, if you want to replicate uh, CN config, you have to do it like this in the CN config uh, configuration. But each backend has its own set of syncrebel statements. So, so basically, with normal data, you wouldn't have to do that. You know, uh, so if I'm if I'm writing configuration management, for example, I'm excluding I'm explicitly excluding the local uh, sync rebel statement, which I would I, what I would consider local. You know? So, but you have to do it in sync rebel configuration for CN config because you basically you replicating all the config at once. And just for the record, I tried earlier, I gave an attempt to just have one <coughs> section per uh, per master, and I actually ran into it where it wasn't replicating correctly, so, um, and I ran out of time in order to troubleshoot that, but, okay, anything else, any other questions before we move on? All right, so we're now in the last 
section of this, we're going to set up the uh, read-only replicas. This is quite a bit simpler than the masters. Um, the instructions are in the, uh, it, it's, I think it's called readme-replica.md in the project. And so we're going to just do the same thing. We're going to copy and paste. And uh, so step one, we're just, as we did before, we're taking the configuration files from the project and, and staging them into the respective locations for the servers. We're going to make the, uh, the folders for the um, configuration. <coughs> C and D. We're going to make the, the folders for the uh, for the, uh, the default databases for each replica. This is again LMDB. And we're going to test the configuration just as we did before to see if the if it's everything points in the right direction. Are so good. Okay, so now you know really it's that simple for this section. So now we fire up those instances to command line and we're mapping C to local six and D to local seven, I believe. C is gonna run on port 391, D is gonna run on port 392. Now let's see if they're running. Uh, oh, you can do your firewall. Uh, Open it up. And then just check to see if the demons are running. Should have four. And, you know, 391, 392. They should be replicating as we speak. Anybody have a problem at this point? Okay, uh, next step, we're gonna test them, I guess. So, all right, so let's look at these. So grab the first one there under 6B. Let's see what we're doing there. Put on the command line so we can see the whole thing. Remember, just put it, just paste it in the console here, it'll be fine. Okay, up there. Okay, so this one is connecting to Replica C as the, uh, there's a service account that was created as part of the sample data. That service account would be, presumably, you'd have like a PAM or a SSSD daemon running that would need access to those replicas in order to do its work. And so we're just testing to see if A, the service account is active, and B, if we can see the, um, the entries under people. So when you hit that search, you'll see the ducks. And um, you're only going to see ducks that have the sample zone Z1, I mean, you'll see, I mean, it can be Z1 to Z2, but it at least has to have Z1 because this is the Z1 replica. Um, so can you, uh, let's see, make sure that they're all Z1 ducks. So we got uh, Hubert, he's a Z1, Z2, and then Dewey is Z1, and that's it, right? So uh, that was successful, the data is replicated, and it's replicating by the filter just the way we want it to. And then the other search is in there. I'm guessing it's going to connect to the other one. Or actually, no, that's up arrow. Yeah, so this one is, yeah, it's connecting to the, the replicate uh, D. And so, and same thing, we're searching on the service account. 
but we expect to see data that is replicating correctly, and we expect to see only zone two ducts in this one. You can have a zone one, but there has to at least be a, because it's a multi-value. So again, Huey isn't going to be in both. In this case, Huey shows up, scroll down a little bit, and he is in zone two ducts. So that, so far so good. The replicates are working the way we want them to. Okay, so then the next search. We do there. Um, okay, here we're just seeing if Huey can see himself. So we got access control list in here, right? So we don't, you know, and then access control lists are going to be very specific to your implementation requirements and so if a lot of times you'll need to give users access to their own entry but not an, another entry so we're just verifying the ACLs on the replicas and here we're verifying that that the Doug Huey can, can read himself so if you hit enter we just expect to see that one and then it can and then what's the next search I think here we're seeing if Huey can read another duck. And yeah, so here we're seeing if, if Huey can read someone else's entry, and we would expect to not, to, not to be able to, according to the access control list. So, uh, general rule, you want to lock it down as much as possible. Any questions about that? Access control list is a Pretty important topic. It's important to get them right. Um, okay, next step. Okay, so we're going to do a little more advanced stuff. So here we're going to add Louis. So Louis is, as we said, he's a zone one duck. So he's only in zone one. So here we're going to add him to zone two. So we're going to point it to the master. We're going to point an update to the master. Go ahead, and, and and then we're just going to so we're going to point it to master A, and we're going to, what that uh, LDIF is doing is it's adding uh, this duck to the other zone. So it did it, and so now you would expect you know, we got replication here. Right? We just hit it, and so the next search is going to valid, verify that he is now in zone one where before he wasn't, and it looks like he is. So we, any questions about that? And we're, we're basically, again, we're controlling which zone entries replicate downward to, based on that original diagram we had where we were uh, you know, we're trying to segregate data. Even though the masters have a complete copy, the replicas can have partial copies. So everything's, you know, at least on Marianne's machine, is working correctly. Uh, so now we're going to just remove Lily from zone one. And we're expecting, so we've removed the multi-value attribute on Louie for zone one. And now we're going to search the uh, zone one machine, and we would expect him to disappear. And can you scroll up, because I don't know what we have And he did. In our case, Louie is now gone. So we had him remove him according to just flipping switches on, those, on that data. <laughs> as you provision users, as they switch their jobs or whatever, or whatever data, you can control them in this way. Okay, so uh, some more context CSN stuff uh, on E, uh, on the E, what is that, the I step under E, we're going to look at the context CSNs on 391. <coughs> uh, 
directory apache.org slash studio right there you can download that to the desktop and um, set it up point it to these configurations most of you already know what it is so i'm, I'm not going to take this through it um, just come talk to me today anytime this week and, and we can do it set it up we'll see how it works uh, it's a pretty handy tool That concludes the prepared materials. 